Welcome to another Top Grades Made Easy video. I'm again with the Light Up Tutor. And we've chosen five pose for pound conflict. Now the reason for that is you do not have to revise all 15. And we've picked five which we think will link to any single poem that can come up in the exam and therefore it will be easy for you to get top marks. Number one, Ozymandias. And we'll always start with the form. The form is what you need in grades eight and nine and a little bit of grade seven. And so if you learn this in advance, the exam automatically wants to put you in top grades. So take us through what's the form of Ozymandias. So think about a sonnet. A sonnet is simply about love poetry. That's what we typically see sonnets are used for to admire something or to adore something. So we can see this in two ways. Firstly, we can link it to Ozymandias' love himself. He's egotistical. We can link it to his hubris. So his hubris is his pride, his ego. So we can say that as a reflection, the sonnet actually mirrors the egotistical love he has for himself. Alternatively, and we always want to go for an alternative interpretation, if you can put in both, do it. We can say that Shelley's actually using the sonnet to mock and ridicule the, the lack of love that Ozymandias had by his people. Because he was a tyrannical ruler, tyrannical tyranny means he was cruel and oppressive. We see that in the way that he treated his people with the sneer of cold command. He was a tyrannical leader. So Shelley could be actually using it to ridicule and mock the idea of tyranny and how, of course, tyranny does not lead to long-lasting power. Think about his shattered facade, a metaphor of how power is not long-lasting when it's ty tyrannical, and instead that people will not love you long-term if you treat them with disrespect, as Ozymandias did. Brilliant. If we pick up on that idea of things that are long-lasting, so Shelley is saying, your tyranny, Ozymandias, isn't long-lasting, even though you thought it would be. Your power has disappeared over time. The other thing that endures in the poem is art. So it's the artist who's carved this statue and has got the sneer of cold command and the wrinkled lip that's captured Ozymandias so brilliantly thousands of years later. And Shelley is playing an interesting game here. He's saying, look, my poem has got a chance to outlast the tyrants in society, just like the statue did, which is why he's saying, look, I'm writing a poem in a sonic form, which has come from Petrarch, which has then been adapted by Shakespeare, but I'm so brilliant that I'm not copying them. I'm mashing them together to come up with my own Shelley form of sonnet. My art is going to outlast everything else. So that hubris that Ozymandias has is also something that Shelley has, but ironically, he was right. We're still studying him. His poem did the job. <laughs> it worked, it worked. Okay, and then meaning. We've kind of touched on this already about tyranny doesn't last. So thinking about the nature of power, particularly focusing on is tyranny and is tyrannical power enduring and long-lasting? He shows through Ozymandias, it is not. You cannot be a tyrant, be cruel and oppressive and exploit your people and treat them with a lack of respect and have that long enduring power. So this is how we can link it to Shelley's meaning and then of course we can link it to the sonic form and how it's a mockery of this long-lasting power that tyrants typically think that they will have. Yeah, examiners get really excited when you start linking the poem to what they call the human condition. And so this idea is that every society will have tyrants in it. Think of Vladimir Putin now. So it's always relevant. It's a timeless theme and they love it when you manage to link it to society now. Definitely. The next thing that you have to consider is how will we link this, Osmandius, to every other poem that could come up. And the easiest way to do that is through the themes. So it obviously links with power, we've talked you through that. Take us through how it links with the power of nature, which the examiners have never asked, but it could still happen. So power of nature. So we think about the nature of human, the power of human nature to begin with. So we're thinking about Ozymandias, his tyranny, we've already spoken about that. But the only thing that is lasting, and that is right at the end, is the sand of time. So we can link it to nature and the fact that nature is continual. Even with this tyrannical power and mankind always believes that, hu that the human power is going to be long-lasting, what always stands the test of time? It is nature. 
He is being engulfed by the sands of time, metaphorically, but also the literal sands of the desert. Because nature will continue even after tyranny, even after these cruel and oppressive leaders, which is still relevant today. It doesn't matter. This power is futile, meaning it's pointless, because the only thing that will be ongoing is nature. Brilliant. Uh, then we get people. So obviously we've got the person in the poem, the tyrant himself, uh, but the other person is the poet and his perspective, and then of course the other one is the artist. So each of those three will be easy to compare to any other people in poems that you're presented with on the day. So there are two places that are relevant here. One is obviously Egypt and the pharaohs. So Ozymandias is an interesting one because Shelley has lied. So he's actually looking at a statue that's come to the British Museum and statues of Ozymandias are still standing now. They're absolutely everywhere. And so his power has lasted and he is visible everywhere. Shelley, of course, has changed that fact. He's lied about the place of Egypt in order to portray tyranny as not long lasting. But the other place that's really interesting is he's writing about Britain. So shortly after writing this poem, Shelley left and he went to live the rest of his life in Italy and Europe. And he rejected Britain because he saw power in Britain, politics in Britain, as corrupt. So he actually left the country. And so his criticism of Ozymandias is also an implied criticism of politics at home. Our next poem is checking out the history. This is an absolute gift to you because it's easy to write about the form. There are two aspects to the form. So whenever he's talking about the European tradition or the British one, he uses a nursery rhyme kind of rhythm and a formal way of expressing that, it's written in rhyming quatrains, four lines that rhyme. And he does that to mock the views of the Europeans and the British who were celebrating their own culture and completely ignoring the culture of uh, other nations, the slave trade, the Africas, the Americas. And that's what he's complaining about in the poem. And therefore the form helps him mock the oppressive view that's giving him what he sees as a completely false and incomplete history. Yeah, 100%. I really like that. I think a massive thing as well that you can link to his intentions is that mockery. He is ridiculing them. It's not a nice way to describe it. And particularly because it's so restrictive. It's very focused on the Eurocentric idea of history and it blinds them both metaphorically and physically. It gives the reader an understanding of the other history that they've been blinded by and oppressed from seeing. So we've also got meaning as well. Agar's quest for self-discovery through cultural identity. And this is so, so fundamental to understanding the poem. He is not just ridiculing and mocking Eurocentric history for reason, but it goes through this journey of self-discovery. Because he has been oppressed, because he has been restricted from seeing his culture and therefore understanding this part of his identity, we see throughout the poem this exploration, going through different historical figures. As he explores his identity, we get an understanding of his culture. So we're going through this self-discovery of his identity with Avon as well. Yeah, that links back to our form. So the stanzas that are about that past, like Shaka the Great Zulu or Nanny de Maroon, all these characters from history that he lists, he deals with them in a much more free verse, which obviously mirrors the freedom that he's now feeling in discovering his identity. And they're a direct contrast with the restricted quatrains that we've had before. So now, how on earth will we use this poem to fit any comparison that comes up? We've got four themes for you that will be easy to fit the poem against. How will it link to a theme of power? So I think like we spoke about with the identity, it's almost like this struggle for power, this struggle for him to be able to see his true identity, to discover it through his culture. So we see this also power struggle as well, this subtle way of him trying to gain back the power through doing the rhyming quatrains, through him mocking the ideas. He's trying to regain back some power and control that he felt like he has lost 
through the Eurocentric history he's been almost blinded with and indoctrinated by and him unable to see his real culture and his real identity but also as well thinking about the power struggle of people throughout history who have also gone through this similar thing of being blinded to their true identity so you could almost see Agard as a microcosm for those who've been oppressed throughout history and those who have been restricted from seeing their true identity through like cultural oppression. Yeah, so that brings us actually to two possible audiences for the poem. One is other people like him who have come to Britain from an immigrant background and he's saying, look, our story has been denied us. And so he's inviting other black people from the African diaspora to have a similar experience to him. But he's also writing it to people like us, teachers in school, you know, teach the right history and as well as a wider white readership, if you like. And he's asking us to see history differently to the way it's being taught. 100%. And then identity. Self-discovery from his identity, what he's been given versus what is true and how that contributes to him forming his identity about himself as a person. And it's very likely that you'll get a war poem comparison. That comes up a lot. And although this doesn't feel like a war poem, there are lots of war instances referenced in it, and in particular, the triumph of Shaka the Great Zulu. We also have Toussaint Louverture, forgive my pronunciation, who defeated Napoleon, and we got Mary Seacole, who went to the Crimean War to give help to the British soldiers. So it's easy to reframe this as a war poem if you need to in the exam. And also as well, if we're going metaphorical with it, that metaphorical war against the Eurocentric history that he's been given and him subtly trying to criticise it. And it's more of like a metaphorical way you can maybe stick in a sentence to say that but not make your whole point about it, if you just want to go out it further. That's really cool, I love that. Uh, and then place, well that's easy, there are so many places listed there and they're all as a direct contrast to Europe and the point of the contrast is to show how they should be just as important as the European history. 100%. 99%. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the third poem we are going through is Exposure. One of my fan favourites, I must admit. So let's go for form first of all, para rhyme. Now, a lot of students will not comment on this, so by you doing that, you're going to differentiate yourself from the masses. So para rhyme, what does that kind of mean? That means that they kind of rhyme. They're not fully deformed rhyme like cat and mat. It's not fully formed rhyme, but they slightly rhyme. So for example, he says nice ass and nervous. So what does that actually showcase? Thinking about the context of World War I, who went to war? A lot of young men. So they never got to fully develop their lives. They never got to fully live because most of them were teenagers or young adults. So the power rhyme could be exposing the propaganda and how these men's life was cut short, not fully developed. I like to the rhyme, it's not fully there, just like they didn't get to fully develop their lives. Alternatively, we could also suggest that as, as a reader, we're waiting for the rhyme to complete. We're waiting for it to fully rhyme, just to like how the soldiers are waiting in anticipation for the war to commence. They are waiting in the trenches, waiting for the battle, waiting for somebody to basically kill them, and then we're left with that nothingness. But nothing happened. So a light to the soldiers, we as a reader, are left in this anticipation, this waiting, this nothingness, so we feel this sense of sympathy with the soldiers as they're going through it. I like those. I'm going to add a third. Go for it. So this is a protest poem written to the people at home to complain about the way the soldiers have been forgotten. And because it's a protest poem, it deliberately unsettles the reader. So just like you said, you're waiting for the rhyme, and it doesn't come, you're unsettled by it. And that links with the message of the poem, which is, dear reader, I want to upset, unsettle you because you can't keep supporting this war because it's inhumane and cruel to us, the people who are fighting it. So now we come to the meaning. So as it's a protest poem, he wants to expose the physical and psychological torture of war. Now we would be expecting him to write about bombs and guns and people being killed by an enemy, but there's an ironic twist. 
It's not the enemy that's killing them, it's the conditions. Why are the conditions killing the soldiers? Because the British haven't prepared for them. The people at home are not looking after the soldiers who, from Owen's point of view, they're sending out callously to die and forgetting about them. Definitely. And I think this thing's back as well to the title. Now, a lot of students won't ever comment on the title, just believe it's the title because it's the title. But Owen has intentionally constructed the title to be exposure because it has this dual meaning. Firstly, he is showing that the soldiers are being physically and psychologically exposed because they're in the trenches. They are battling this warfare, but actually the real battle is the weather conditions, the brutality, the belligerence of it, the waiting. But also he's showing and exposing the reality of war. Thinking about at the time, people were very patriotic, i.e. they loved their country, they were supporting the war, there was lots of propaganda, basically, that was used to make people support the war. So he is trying to expose how inhumane, basically meaning it's really bad to the humans who were suffering from it, how belligerent it was, how harsh it was. That is what he's trying to expose. That's a brilliant top grade analysis of the title. Fantastic. So now we're going to give you four themes that you can link this to. Why would you bother? Well, because the other poem you get in the exam is likely to be linked to one of these themes. So you be able to compare it to any poem. Well, obviously this is a war poem. Remember, what's he protesting about? What does he want to change? I think we've covered that brilliantly. The next is identity. That seems a tricky one. So light up has got you sorted. So, <laughs> I've got you covered. So identity, I love this one for exposure because most students won't comment on it. So let's think about soldiers. Let's link it right back to in the war. They were expected to be masculine, to be dominant, to be powerful. There was no such thing as mental health back then. And particularly if men went out of the war, they were branded as a coward. So in this identity, the soldier's identity is inextricably, which means closely linked, to their strength. But what do we see in Owen? What is he exposing? He is exposing that these men are being emasculated, basically lesser of a man, by the weather, which seems to be such a contrasting belief that the weather can make men less powerful, but he is showing how these men are being emasculated by even the snowflakes that are falling. They are literally rotting in the trenches. They're becoming less of men, and they believe that because now they're being completely tortured, not by the war itself, but by nature, it makes them the lesser of a man. So this is how we can link war and identity and their emasculation by the weather. Love it. And the quote I would use with that is the final one, all their eyes are ice. And so he's talking about them losing their identity, so their eyes are now just ice, they're no longer human beings, but also it's a homophone, so it's a pun, their eyes, their identity, are now no longer people, they're just ice. Definitely. And then we go to nature. We've kind of linked it. I think these two link really well about the power of nature, and particularly we see it in the way that he personifies it. So that dawn massing in these, her melancholy army. That the dawn, the coming of a new day, is now symbolic of death and destruction. So every new day that unravels is another day for them to be destroyed and emasculated by the weather. So I think these two link really nicely because by talking about the omnipotence, so the power of nature, then you can link it to how they lose their power to it and become emasculated. So here's a question for you. Go on. Do you see the poem as showing that nature is protesting against the human war? and therefore turning against humankind, was that going too far? Oh, I haven't thought about that. But I think you could definitely hold it that Owen is critiquing it from both standpoints. Yeah. That even nature and things that are natural are going against it because war is such an unnatural process. Nice. Love that. Place. There are two places being criticised here. One is obviously the war itself and these freezing conditions. But remember, it's a protest poem, and so the place that's really being criticised is back home. That's where we get this verse where he starts dreaming about being at the fireside back home, because he wants the readers back home to realise the luxury that they have as a consequence of the terrible conditions that the soldiers have, and he wants them to start protesting against the war. Poem number four, London. So the form of this is really easy to describe. 
It's written in quatrains, it's got an A, B, A, B, Y scheme, but so what? <laughs> so what? Who cares? <laughs> so first, let's just quickly say what A, B, A, B is. It's pretty easy for you to spot. If you look to the end of the first line, and then look to the end of the third line, they would rhyme. Look at the second line and the fourth line, they would rhyme. So technically, you're going to write letters next to it. First one would be A, second one would be B, third one would be A, fourth one would be B. So you can actually look at your poem to spot A, B, A, B, just so you kind of know what it is. But A, B, A, B, what is the significance? Why do we care? Firstly, thinking about it's very restrictive. The whole poem is about oppression, about the oppression of the government, from the church, which we'll go on to, and how he is against establishment, established religion, established government, and how they enforce these mind force manacles upon the people of London. They impress them, they enslave them. And that is literally shown through the quatrains. Each line, each stanza is only four lines. It's rigid, it's controlled, there's no freedom of expression. As with the ABAB, there's no way he can express his views or it's all restricted because London at the time, or well, based on his views, was restrictive and oppressive. And the other thing about it is that Blake was obsessed with these childlike kind of rhyme schemes. So every poem he ever wrote followed a really predictable rhyme scheme. And I think one of the reasons is connected to this being a protest poem. So if I'm trying to make a protest, I want you, the audience, the reader, to remember what's the easiest way to get you to remember my message to give you a really simple rhyme scheme, really simple poem, so that the words become memorable. We have pop songs, Blake didn't, but he had poetry and simple rhyme schemes. So just as well for a bit of context about Blake, there was two big collections of poetry that he wrote the songs of innocence and songs of experience. He called them songs, they weren't songs, they were poems, but they were the two collection of poems. So this is actually from the songs of experience. So he is basically exposing and revealing the real experiences of people in London, and particularly during the time when Great Britain was defined as this great rising empire, he's exposing the realities of the people within it who face this oppression from the establishments and the government and the church. Yeah, so this follows on from the Romantic tradition where poets are celebrating the power of nature and he's saying, look, another thing that's happening in our society is everyone's being sucked into the cities. This is urbanisation and that is dehumanising people and also destroying the cities, which is why he talks about the chartered streets and the chartered Thames. The idea being that all property is carved up and owned by the rich and the everyday people in London therefore lead this sort of restricted life that you referred to. Uh, how can we see it as a criticism of the monarchy? So again, linking into the idea of like romantic poets. Now, when we say romantic poets, first it's with a capital R, and it doesn't mean they write about love poetry. Let's just clear that up because a lot of people go, he's a romantic, he loves love. Yeah. Not quite. They were all about liberation of the individual, freedom. And let's just be really, really clear as well when we go about the monarchy and the church. He is not anti-religion. And this is really, really clear. He's not anti-religion, he's anti-establishment. And what that basically means, he's anti the people who put these rules in place and say like, you can't do this. The church will, you know, be advocating of love and benevolence, yet they won't give to the poor. So this is when he's criticising these establishments, those who dictate the authority, but are actually quite contradictory in their beliefs. Yeah, and that, that's why we've got uh, not a description of the king or the queen, we've got a description of the soldiers' blood on the palace walls, the ordinary person sacrificing themselves for the rule makers. Um, and so what he's saying is, these all enslave and curse people. And that's why he ends the poem with the harlot's curse, the idea of hypocritical men out having sex outside of wedlock and therefore cursing their marriages because of their infidelity, but there's also a hint that it's an actual physical curse in that they're transmitting sexual disease not just to their wife, but then to their unborn children, which is why it ends so pessimistically. So now, how will that link to the other poems? We've got four themes for you, power and control. So power and control, like we've kind of linked. 
Again, we can see it in two ways, literally speaking about the oppressive power of establishment that Blake is directly criticising as a romantic poet. And another way we can kind of just link that as well, you can say that's a trope of romantic poets, a trope which is something they do throughout their work. And then again, we can link it to, although he does the A.B. A.B. Ryan scene, the quatrains, his message throughout is rebelling against the control that they are enforcing and restricting upon the people in London. Lovely. It obviously links to the identity of the individual and he's saying, look, in every person I meet, I hear these marks of woe. Everyone is not just the same, but they're at the same level of misery. And no one is able to be an individual because they have the mind forged manacles that oppressive control in society has given them. Definitely. And then place, of course, it's very obvious. Where is the place? Oh, it's in London, who knew? So of course he is criticising London, the hub of this great empire of Great Britain, and he's criticising that even in this place where the monarchy are, the church is so prevalent, they have so much power and control, the people within it are so restricted. Time is also a major theme here. Remember it ends with the infant, and what he's suggesting is that the oppression that happens now at the time he's writing is going to carry on through the generations because of urbanisation and the lack of the romantic ideal staying in the countryside. Definitely. And also, if we look at the marriage hearse, really interesting thing about marriage, new beginnings, hearse is for funerals. So again, that very bleak image that Blake leaves us with, and it kind of stains the reader's mind that every new beginning is paired with a bleak end. How depressing. <laughs> Number five, kamikaze. So here Garland is writing completely from imagination. She hasn't got a particular kamikaze pilot in mind. Don't think she's even been to Japan. But she writes it in free verse. Why does she do that? How does that link to the meaning of the poem? Well, this is a man, a pilot, who wants to break free of all the social and cultural expectations on him. He has been chosen to commit suicide by flying a plane into an American ship. He doesn't want to lose his life that way, so he turns back and flies home. The irony, of course, is that he can't have that freedom, even though he lives, he ends up coming back to a society that imprisons him and puts even more control over him. Definitely. And also then after looking at the meaning, the culture both unites and oppresses us. So now this is really interesting because if we see, of course, it's presented from the daughter's perspective as we're reading through it, we can see that it unites in a way that they are together in their beliefs. They are together in their beliefs that when a man embarks on this suicide mission, that he should die and his family are very accepting of it. They're almost united in this strange way together in that, but also it oppresses us. It controls the mind of the people around them. Think of how unnatural it is that a father's gonna come home from war, still alive, yet he is ostracized, like isolated from society, from his own family. So it just goes to show that the impact and how oppressive culture really can be, even on like familial relationships, and we see that explored through the poem. Yeah, I and mean, she talks specifically about how the children still loved him until they were taught not to. And the word taught shows us how that oppression works. There are two interpretations of the poem I want to talk about. There's the conventional one, and then there's the right one. <laughs> I would say there's the conventional yeah, one, and then there's a non-conventional one. So the conventional one is that he comes back and he's rejected by his whole family. And then when we get that final line, he want, she wondered which had been the better way to die. It's describing his life and his family as a kind of death and maybe suggesting he would be better off by dying as a kamikaze pilot. However, there's a lot of italics in this poem and the italics guide you into who is saying what and when. And so there's this really tricky line where the mother says, yes, grandfather's boat. So you're going to be my kids, I'm going to be the mother. And when I say to you, yes, grandfather's boat, what have you said to me as my kid? I don't know. My reply is, it's grandfather's boat. Yes, it's grandfather's boat. Oh, I'm asking the question about grandfather. Yes, who is your grandfather? 
The kamikaze pilot? Yes! So you were talking about the grandfather who is the kamikaze pilot who has a boat. In other words, what we're being invited to understand there is that I have rejected my father when I was a kid, but my kids have not. They now have a grandfather. And so at the end of the poem, you've got this idea that he's being brought back into the family mm. through the daughter who's writing the poem. Yeah. That is the unconventional view. Nobody talks about that. Yeah. Even Garland herself yeah. claims that he's being written out and yeah. he's better off dead. Yeah, it could be also seen, interestingly, because the daughter, when she was younger, accepted her father, accepted she had one, so perhaps the grandchildren will go through that similar cycle of accepting their grandfather, but as they're older, they'll be oppressed by the social and cultural norms to then almost blank him out. Oh, such a downer. No one will say no because the mother's poem is, is portraying him in another way. So you think that her, she's giving the children a chance to re reminisce about him the way that she didn't get to as she became oppressed as she got older? Yes. Interesting. But you can disagree. <laughs> but I think that's the whole thing. It's like you can handle terms of interpretation. So, you know, people can say, oh, it's interpreted in one way, but these small references, it's not like you're making that up in the text. Yeah, that yeah. exists. Yes. So you can see it as, oh, potentially, this is then breaking the cycle, breaking these oppressive norms, and perhaps, yes, children can create a better future because two generations down the line, they're beginning to reminisce in a positive way about their grandfather. Yeah, I'm an optimist, so I'm going there. <laughs> right, so we have some themes for you, which will help you compare it to other poems. Well, identity, we've covered that a lot here. He's got his cultural identity, but then this new identity that he's taken on for himself by refusing to kill himself. Obviously, it links to any single war poem. This is about the horrible, destructive power of war. What could we say about place? I think it's interesting in time of place, right? If we're looking at the perspective of we've got the daughter, we've got the place in her physical place where she's retelling the story, we've got the context about the Japanese pilot and where he's flying in war, then we also kind of shift in different time and places to the present day. We get a kind of real holistic view of this timeline of the pilot, him going to war, his children growing up, and then of course his daughter recounting the story to her children. So we could actually see it's almost set in multiple places because we get, as she does, a view of the whole of history of her father from start to end. Yes. So I guess we could say that the place stays the same, but the view of it changes through yeah, time. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And that's going to bring us to the power of nature. Everybody panics about power of nature being a question. Uh, I love this because what prompts the kamikaze pilot to turn around is all this imagery of nature the boats displayed on the water, the fish that he can see actually from however many thousand feet he is. And it's that vision of nature which makes him cherish life again and turn back to preserve life. Definitely. And I think also you could even go for the interpretation of like, is this a natural way to die? Like thinking oh, of the yes, suicide as well yes. in terms of, is this natural for somebody to sacrifice their own life for a bigger picture of war, which again is an unnatural thing. So that contrast of the unnatural sacrifice and the unnatural war with nature, I think, accentuates that as well. Fantastic. We've shown you how these five poems can link to any question that comes up. In the next video, we're going to show you how one essay plan can link to any question on an inspector calls that comes up. And you can see it on the Light Up Tutors channel. Amazing. Well, we'll see you in the next video, guys. <laughs> And it's on the lighting, what's it, what? <laughs>